Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on um, Monday, January 8th, 2024 at 7 p.m. here at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call a roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Ellis. Uh, Member Hannes? Here. Member Harris? Here. Member Olchick? Here. Member Weiner? Here. Member Hughes? Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic that, uh, to be addressed. These can be placed in that basket <coughs> over there to my right. I have allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment and ask everyone to keep their comments to three minutes. We're going to start out as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance, so I'd like to welcome the uh, Student Council from Hillcrest to help us say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> and I would like to welcome up Principal Zebka. Welcome. Thank you so much. Good evening and Happy New Year. We are excited to <coughs> welcome our student council officers. Come on up here and join me. Um, I do want to also give a howl out and recognition to our staff supervisors, Mrs. Lavia and Mrs. Rogers, who are here as well. Hi, my name is Kira O'Donohue and I'm our student council president. We would like to share some things about our school and our student council. Hillcrest is a great school because it's open to everyone and meets the needs of each individual student. One of the things we really enjoy doing is grade level buddies. This is where an older grade is paired with a younger grade and students across the building get to know each other better. Hillcrest Families is another time where grade levels mix and work on team building activities that go along with the book is topic of the month. We love getting to know students and staff from other grade levels. As the oldest students in the building, we get to serve as mentors to the younger students and help lead Hillcrest family meeting activities. Hi, my name is Audrina Tong and I am Vice President of Spirit. Hillcrest School follows three important rules. Be respectful, be responsible, and be safe. Hillcrest, all right, all right. Students at Hillcrest earn pause slips for demonstrating these behaviors in their classroom, as well as other parts of the school. At the end of each month, Mrs. Zepka pulls pause slips during our possum lunch raffle drawing, and students get called up to the stage to choose a prize. A hound dog of the month from each class is also recognized at our all-school meetings for demonstrating school expectations throughout the month. Hi, my name is Johnny Calavenio and I'm the Vice President of Service. Once a month we meet as a school in the gym for an all-school meeting. Each grade is responsible for introducing a new focus topic to the school each month. Our focus topic for December was grit. During our Hillcrest Families meeting, we discuss what grit and growth mindset means to us and work together on challenging activities, building a tower out of cards. This requires us to use a lot of grit. Hmm. Hi, my name is Rachel Reynolds and I am the recording secretary. My name is Tommy Dustman and I'm the clerical secretary. We've had many service projects this school already. One of our service projects at the end of October was to donate candy to Operation Support Our Troops. Over three days after Halloween, we were able to collect 121 pounds of candy to donate to the troops. Personally, I never eat all of my Halloween candy. It makes me feel good to be able to give it to others. In November, we also collected travel size personal items for holiday stockings for Operation Support Our Troops. In December, we collected food items to donate to our local fish food pantry. Our collection weighed a total of 352 pounds. This month, we plan to make Valentine's cards for senior citizen centers in our community. We'd like to welcome up our PTA co-presidents, Kelly Fallon Wilson and Katie Wojciechowski.
Hi, I'm Kelly Fallon Wilson. I have four kids at Hillcrest, a sixth grader, a fifth grader, and two first graders. Uh, I'm Katie Wojciechowski. I have two kids at Hillcrest, a sixth grader and a third grader. We're the co-presidents. Um, we're excited to talk to you for a couple minutes tonight. Um, I think one of the things that makes Hillcrest PTA very special is that we, we work really hard to create a family atmosphere. Um, we want everyone to feel welcome and like they um, have a voice and um, that their opinion matters to everyone. Um, so we, uh, we have a lot of programs that we feel very proud of. Um, something new that we did this year. Am I supposed to talk about this? Or <laughs> <laughs> Um, like Kelly said, our newest initiative this year um, was called the Celebrations Tree, and um, Kelly and I were super proud to uh, start this new tradition at Hillcrest. So during our holiday season, it's so much about community and about giving and sharing, and um, Hillcrest as a school, um, Principal Zapka sets the tone with the We Are Family motto and slogan. So Kelly and I tried to carry that through the holiday season. So we leaned on our families and um, our teachers and we assigned grade levels different holidays that are celebrated all around the world so that our students could learn about all different celebrations, including Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, Eden, and many, many others. Um, so each grade level then worked um, with family volunteers and their teachers to create an art project that could be hung on the outside tree. So our tree stood outside Hillcrest and was filled with all of these celebrations and holidays. This also allowed a lot of our students um, who celebrated holidays that aren't always spotlighted to have a voice and share with their fellow students about their experiences at home and really bring their home experience to their Hillcrest community. Well, um, we have some ongoing programs that we wanted to highlight too. One is new family mentoring. Right, so um, we welcome <coughs> families to Hillcrest every year, not just our incoming kindergarten families, but families that possibly have moved to our community. And before school starts, the PTA in the summer works with our um, office staff and we assign a mentor to these families. So as these new families are coming into Hillcrest, a, a, um, their mentor will reach out, usually via email, just provide a little, hey, welcome to the community, I have students in the following grades. And throughout the year then, we ask these mentors to reach out to these families, making sure they understand all the communication that comes from the district, from Mrs. Zepka, from the PTA. Do you have any questions? No question is, you know, too little, too small. Um, we feel strongly that this program helps develop this community feel right from the get-go. So these families and their students are very much welcomed as soon as those doors open on the first day of school. Um, another ongoing program that uh, is somewhat special to Hillcrest is Partners in Art. Um, so this is a little bit of an enhancement to our regular art education. Um, parents sign up for up to four um, presentations per year per, per classroom. Um, of different artists that uh, the parent then teaches the children about, and the the presentations are all existing. We had a we had a parent start this program probably almost 20 years ago, um, and and she did a great job organizing everything and making it very easy for parent volunteers. So typically, a couple of parent co volunteers come into the classroom. Let's say you're learning about Van Gogh. Um, they choose an art project to do with the kids. They do a little short slideshow that's all set up for them. Um, and then we do have places throughout the building where some of those artworks can be displayed so that other kids can appreciate it, so that parents walking through the school can see them, um, administrators can see them, um, and the kids really seem to like it. And it's also a nice way for parents to feel like they get to be a little bit more involved in the school community and um, being in the classroom, which of course, well, most parents yeah. love to do. <laughs> And again, keeping in um, Michelle Zepka's motto, we are family, 
Kelly and I as co-presidents examine all of our events and we try and make sure that we offer several free events for our families as well. So a bingo night or a family movie night and we do hear the chatter among the students like, hey, are you going to bingo night or am I going to see you at movie night? Again, just making sure that we are creating a community feel within the building and outside of school hours. Um, Kelly and I have really enjoyed that part, I would say, of our responsibilities. We showed ELF in December and that was very popular. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those, that's a little bit of a highlight of some of the programs that the PTA at Hillcrest is responsible for and the things that we're really proud of. Um, again, we, we feel very lucky to have such a collaborative and positive relationship with Michelle and I think that that shows in, um, in the involvement with the PTA and just the general positive feelings I think all around and the family community that we feel like we've helped build. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, our school theme uh, this year is really an enhancement uh, from last year's We Are Family. Um, we Are Family, which leads right into anything is possible. Uh, this is centered around our philosophy that you have heard about, really establishing those relationships between staff, students, um, the larger community with all of our families. Um, our student council and PTA shared some of the things that we value most at Hillcrest. Um, I'm going to touch on just a couple of minutes here, um, some of the work that we have been doing as a school to continue to align with our district strategic plan um, and further support student growth. So um, a little bit of data here to start out with. Uh, last year, we or a year ago, so this would have been spring 2022, um, we looked at our reading grade, grade level growth scores from the spring map, um, where we had 63% of students meeting the benchmark. When we compared that to IAR in the spring of 2022, looking at our ELA performance, which includes writing, uh, only 47% of students met those expectations. So throughout all of last year, we really focused as a school on increasing student writing stamina, developing student writing strategies, enhancing our instruction um, through student writing conferences. So fast forward, um, with a concerted focus on writing one year later, we saw notable success with 61% of our students uh, meeting expectations for MAP. Um, but then when we looked at our spring 23 IAR data, um, which again is incorporating writing, that number increased to 66% of students meeting expectations, an increase of almost 20% over the year. Um, so very proud of our gains there. Um, so we took that data and started to just dig deeper and look further. Um, our instructional leadership team then la at the end of last year collected some additional evidence through the analysis of our spring benchmark data. Um, looking at those assessment scores and then have um, we had teachers just do some observational data during um, their benchmark reading instruction. So it was noted that students really in third through sixth grades often demonstrate success with comprehension, um, demonstrating those comprehension skills during classroom discussions, um, when asked to respond orally to comprehension questions. But the results of the survey really noted um, weaknesses in both written expression and conventions um, at nearly all of the third through sixth grade levels. So anecdotally, uh, teachers specifically no noticed that students were struggling with expanding their thoughts and ideas in writing on online assessments. Um, we hypothesized that a contributing factor to the, was the lack of exposure and practice with completing that multi-step process um, of responding to those questions you know, when you're reading one or more texts and then you're, you know, further compounding the complexity of that task 
by having to generate a typed response. So you need to read the two texts, generate ideas, organize your thoughts, and then they're hunting and pecking their way through trying to type the response. So it appeared that a good part of the ideas that they had were lost during that process. Um, so out of this came our two part, um, or one of our school improvement goals, that is two parts. Part one being enhancing our reading comprehension instructional strategies to support students being able to read the multiple texts and synthesize that information and be able to orally respond to questions. But then part two of that is really extent, an extension of the previous goal um, from last year with grades three through six really working to develop that writing fluency and more specifically while using technology. So in partnership with our instructional coach, uh, we worked as an instructional leadership team to plan and design monthly professional development activities. This was introduced to all of our staff at the beginning of the school year. Um, the professional development at this point has really been focused around understanding grade level, the grade level pro progression of um, the target standards and then really consistent use of curriculum resources. That's helping to provide that continuity with instruction. It's helping teachers to better understand and focus their efforts. Um, furthermore, we've been analyzing our assessment survey. Um, so after each um, benchmark unit assessments, we ask teachers to complete a reflective survey where we are looking at and measuring the success students have um, from the online assessment, but then further, we're analyzing the writing outcomes and we're also tracking the typing practice um, that students in grades two through six are getting. So this is keeping the implementation certainly at the forefront of our minds, but then it's also helping us plan um, future professional development focused topics. Um, in the end, you know, or I shouldn't say in the end, coming up rather, um, we're going to be comparing some student writing samples across grade level teams. We'll be sharing some of the struggles and successes that we're having so far this year with those instructional strategies, uh, specifically with increasing and improving um, that written output in response to reading multiple texts. We will continue to um, forge through. I have to be transparent in saying that the taking of the online assessments um, has notably been more challenging than we anticipated. Um, however, with persistence, students um, are becoming more comfortable, more confident, um, definitely more skilled in synthesizing the information, but um, it is a work in progress nonetheless. Uh, ultimately, you know, there's several positive outcomes that we anticipate coming from this, really working towards more enjoyment with reading and writing and kids being able to read and then show us what they know and demonstrate um, that not only in their um, classroom discussions in oral language, but also in writing. Um, this is just, again, one component or focus area for our school improvement plan. Um, nonetheless, we are excited about our work and really eager to continue to um, strive for uh, more seeing the benefits uh, and uh, resulting growth that our students will make over time. So thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Um, and one more round of applause here for our amazing hound dogs. Thank you so much for being here this week and uh, thank you to the PTA. And for our student council members, we got some gifts for you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. <laughs> All right, listed on tonight's agenda are five communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications a board member would like to share at this time? Okay, and that brings us up to a, our spotlight tonight, which is on the gifted programming. Is there hurt? 
Welcome. Good evening, board. How are you? Um, this evening, um, Eleni uh, Gajewski and I will be giving you an update on the gifted committee's work. Eleni will be walking through um, some work that the committee has done with doable differentiation by Jan Kaisi and then um, talking a little bit about our MTSS processes and how our gifted um, students are part of that continued work. Additionally, we will um, review our current programming and then continued focus on meeting the needs of our students five days a week, which will go into our continued work of the gifted committee, which is coming forward um, within one of the next um, upcoming meetings with a recommendation of what we want programming to look like moving forward. Um, this will be a um, additional process in terms of um, information that we will share that we would like to incorporate for next school year and then in subsequent school years as well. And then finally, I will give um, just a quick update on the math acceleration um, programming and where our work lands right now. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Kajewski to come up. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm going to go by my notes a little bit more than I typically do because I get pretty excited about what I'm sharing tonight and I want to keep it concise for you. Um, the work that we've been doing the last time I was here speaking to you, I shared that our committee, some of our members attended a workshop last spring by Jan Kaisi and the brain research on cognitive learning that she did. And this is a little bit different than what we typically know of learning styles. It's not your auditory learning and kinesthetic learning necessarily. There's much more to it. So um, I'm going to give you just kind of a surface level but some of the strategies that our committee has been doing through the book study and then we brought this to all staff during our grade level meetings so they've experienced most of the strategies um, or some of the strategies that were in the book and I'll share some examples about how these strategies then support our students with that MTSS that multi-tiered systems framework that Liz was talking about so the first one is a wait go card and we have a room full of introverts and extroverts in here some of us as extroverts are more comfortable jumping out speaking up sharing right away and then some of us believe it or not more like me are introverts and it takes a bit of time to just kind of process what I'm comfortable saying and we have students in the classroom who are are within those two and we're a little bit of both, right? So at the grade level meetings, our staff was given an article to read. They were each given a card. On one side it says wait and it is red and on the other side it says go and it is green. And the students per se are told once you finish reading the article, flip your card from wait to go. And that way the teacher knows you are finished reading, you are ready now to engage in conversation. And the purpose of these cards is to really give our introverts in particular time to process. Time to show that I am now ready to have this conversation, but also our extroverts who are excited and confident in sharing right away, they're eager to share. But what they know is I have this card that is demonstrating to my teacher I have something to share. I'm going to have that opportunity to share. I don't need to be the first one to share it. Because oftentimes some of our students think, I wanted to say that, but somebody else said it before I could. The next one, there's a quote up here about student discourse, student conversation, and this is a very powerful uh, quote, that the student discourse is the most powerful K-12 differentiation strategy, and it is easy to implement, and it meets the needs of all of our learners, but also our gifted students and their unique learning needs. So in this example here, we have um, a web. In the center is a topic. You could have students read an article. It could be a math word problem. It could really be anything for any content area or specials. And students then will write about it on the outside. So an example, I've done this with advanced students for math, and they've written on the outside ways to solve a word problem. I've done it with social studies as well with, um, with a topic that they've read on an article and taking a certain stance on it. So the students here, they could even differentiate with drawing versus writing, but it's getting students engaged. They're having their conversations. They're thinking about what they might say through their writing first before they engage in those conversations. And then they're working on all of their social skills. So they're reading, they're writing, but they're also they're listening, they're collaborating, and they're ha sh demonstrating critical thinking skills. The next one is based on the brain research about how our, our brains want something novel and something as simple as a basket can provide that novelty. So in a primary grade, this could be something with um, particular letters that we're jumping into, pulling out you know, a ball and a bat and certain th um, 
little visuals or toys or so forth and talking about the letters and then blending them. Or it could be about social studies topics. Up here I have an example. It says consider the following terms. Rugby, boredom, 70%, ice fishing, school, and anting. How might each be related to the topic of crows? Okay, right away your brain is scrambling for a number of ways to make connections so we're engaging the students before they might even engage into a topic. This could be done again with math word problems, with vocabulary problems, or creative writing topics. So we're meeting the needs of our learners on all of their different levels here. Eventually you could have students create the topics that go into the basket too. I have three examples here. The first two are in PE. I'm now showing how we can use the differentiation strategies to create, um, to foster some curiosity as students engage into a new topic in their specials areas. And then the last one is science. Uh, for PE, this is an example of what you could do by demonstrating or showing visuals of different sports equipment throughout the decades. And then that is getting students into that conversation and that learning about the evolution, evolution of sports equipment and how they've evolved in safety moving forward. So this is called an anticipatory guide. It's a great way to start out something new that we are about to study and dive into. Just about done here. Uh, the planned movement one. This one I did on Institute Day with our staff last year. So they were given an example of two different learning scenarios, two different learning environments, and they were told to choose one. They had to go to one side of the room for one and another side of the room for the other. And then they engage in conversation and discourse across the rooms. So if you were on this side, you would explain why you chose that side. And the hope is also to uh, persuade somebody from the other side to actually switch and come over to your side. So very engaging for the students. You're listening to what other students are saying and you're really mulling it over and analyzing it and synthesizing your thoughts in there. This can be done with four corners as well, but a great strategy. It's great for ages five to 55 years old and doesn't require any prep. And then last but not least, I don't think I have a favorite, but this one I do have a connection. My daughter and I, she's nine years old, we've been taking improv classes. And this is actually one of the strategies in there, and we love this game. And so when I saw this in this book, I had a light bulb really go off onto it about how it really engaged us at all different levels, and it really meets the needs of our, our students at all different levels, including our gifted learners. So it's yes and. Students are talking before they are writing, so they're really mulling over their ideas as I mentioned earlier too. But the purpose here is to almost give a bone to the other person to build off of and to keep the conversation going so it bounces off in a ping pong manner and you're then developing even deeper through the thoughts. So the example here, student A would say, I think Ron is going to betray Harry because his envy is growing. For example, in the story and then giving evidence. Now student B, instead of saying, yeah, I don't think so, they're gonna say yes, and. Those are the two words that you always need to include. Yes, and it seemed like Harry is siding with his other friend and Ron feels betrayed. Back to student A. Yes, and, and now they're continuing to pull in some evidence from the text that they're reading. Again, this can be done with any specials, any content area, but they're learning that collaboration and working on those critical thinking skills too. So I'm gonna go through the current model, which you're all very familiar with. Uh, we have uh, one day a week. Students are bused to one of our schools. So they spend a full day at one of our schools. They are with mixed schools there then. Uh, we feel like students' needs are being met. They are excited and they are engaged in what they're doing. I love when I get to come to these classrooms. But we also got some student feedback as well. And we understand that as much as we try and work any special events around the days that students are going to their gifted classroom, sometimes it does coincide with it. We also know that our students who leave for their gifted classrooms are very mindful about what they might be missing for their core instruction and just making sure that they are up to pace in there. So we wanna keep in mind some of those social emotional needs as well. Our gifted teachers are extremely strong in social emotional learning and that is embedded. I see it throughout every lesson that they do. The standards are also embedded through their inquiry based projects that they're working on throughout their thematic units. And then their interests and their strengths are built, um, built upon through those engaging activities. Then last, we have newsletters. Our teachers send a newsletter not only home to our families, 
but also to the teachers who have students going to the gifted classroom. So they are also aware of what are the students working on, not only the topic, but the social emotional skills, the academic skills, and the content areas. So the continued work of our committee, um, we know from Douglas Reeves and his research that change is best built and sustained when it's built off of strengths. And that truly has been the foundation of the committee's work for the past few years. So we've worked on the what, and now we are starting to transition, or we have been transitioned into the how. How do we do this? So we've looked at our gifted standards, we've looked at our curriculum, and we have also really dug into what I call the ICCC, the inquiry, the creativity, the collaboration, and the critical, uh, uh, critical thinking skills. But what we want to continue to do is think about that. How do we meet the needs of our students through the five days a week? You've heard me say it like a broken record. They are gifted five days a week, not just one day a week. And the differentiation work that I just shared with you is one of those ways that we're doing that through our tiered systems of support. Here we're working through a process by Cotter and Wagner, and their research is really around systems changed, and it's listed up there, evaluate, focus, plan, and review. We have dug into evaluate, and we have been focusing on a number of different areas of our gifted model in tandem. We've looked at the model framework, we've looked at curriculum, uh, the differentiation and supporting that, as I mentioned, the criteria and identification process, and more. So we'll continue to support the differentiation within our committee and um, beyond our committee as well. We have that responsive learning environment with these strategies and looking at all of the different traits of our gifted learners and how do we support our classroom teachers um, to build that stamina and that depth in the general education setting. So we'll continue that work through our multi-tiered systems of support through MTSS. We understand that we have a very large district and that we have changes coming up and exciting changes. And one of those changes is sixth grade going to middle school. And so with that said, our committee right now would like to take a step back of the focus on sixth grade gifted programming. We have been focusing on fourth grade in particular and knowing that in a couple years those fourth graders are going to go to sixth grade at the middle school. That's a big program change. And so we would like to shift our focus to stay on fourth grade and then move into that sixth grade when they go into that model. The middle school currently has mixed grades also. So when we do make that shift, we are also gonna look at adding content areas into it. So it won't just be ELA focused, but how do we embed some other content areas, science, social studies in there. For criteria, uh, the committee is they're still thoroughly examining this process as well, making sure that we do have a thorough and accurate process for our identification process of our students. So we want to ensure that what we are evaluating going forward is what we're measuring. We want to make sure it's reliable and valid. Are we looking at any adjustments in criteria? Are we looking at any instructional delivery models? So that's a conversation that our committee is going to continue to do and discern whether there will be any potential adjustments to that criteria process or not. One of the things we have talked about and will continue to talk about is we may do a small group focus on that and that will allow us to in tandem work on that identification process too, uh, but still have a heavier focus of it in the fall as we focus more so on that program model. So with all said, uh, we will work towards having that collective agreement and uh, maintain that commitment to have that thorough evaluation process, but also a program that continues to meet the needs of our students and that any of the decisions that we make are in the best interest of all of our students, but particularly our gifted students for this program model, and we'll keep you up to date for any of our progress going forward. And as Liz said, we'll be back in spring to share more specifics. I continue to just be floored by the work of our gifted committee. You can see just how passionate this group of educators is in ensuring that we're providing the best programming for our students and really being thorough in their review and recommendations. So we're hoping in the next um, month or two or at one of our upcoming future meetings to um, have that recommendation of what programming could look like for the upcoming school year and in terms of if we are going to make any adjustments to our criteria based model um, or if that will maintain in our current system. Um, the final 
update that I want to give the board is just um, the process of our math acceleration um, program. So each year we do evaluate that process and the assessment procedures. The students are currently taking their winter benchmark assessments, which will guide um, our collection of their data in determining if we have a new batch of students who will move into our acceleration process. Um, we have established our timeline for identification, which goes through a cycle of um, reviews, teacher recommendation, um, as well as principal overview. And then we take those numbers, we look at how many students um, are currently in our um, acceleration program. We currently have 800 students throughout the district that run through our acceleration program. So it's not a small feat to figure out where everybody goes and what classrooms they need to be in, um, but we're really proud of the work that has been done. Additionally, um, we will look at any new students who will be part of that acceleration process, create class lists, and then determine any transportation needs if we do have to bus students from school to school. Um, additionally, we look at any of our students who are in our single accelerated program and make determination if they need to be double accelerated in their math programming. So those are all things that will be coming up. None of the actual processes or evaluation um, criteria will be changing for the upcoming year, but I'll give you updates um, throughout the upcoming months in terms of um, any up or updates that are happening within our math acceleration process. Any questions from the board? Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Questions from the board? You have a question. Oh, sure. Um, it was mentioned um, that the committee has collected data from students, student voice data regarding their experiences in the extended program. Um, as a parent, and just knowing other parents whose children participate in the program, um, you know, I, I hear about the struggles of being, um, leaving class once a day, especially when you get into your, let's say you're sixth grade and you're doing seventh or eighth grade math. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm aware anecdotally <laughs> of attrition uh, when you look at kids who are enrolled in extended fourth grade and then looking at the sixth grade numbers. So what is, what if, what are your takeaways in terms of addressing that and also like, do we, um, not that, that not to say that we need to you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and reinvent sure. that model, but do we have a lot of confidence that that one day a week model over at another school is is serving us in, in the best fashion that it could? Right, and I and I definitely think that the the work of the committee has been to determine what would be the best way that we may be able to service a group of students within their home school five days a week, um, while keeping in mind that that math block is kind of um, a, a time that is carved out of their day and ensuring that we are pro providing that support at maybe a different time for their gifted learning. Um, so that definitely would um, attribute to how we would reduce the number of students who maybe would d decide to not participate in our gifted programming. Because we have seen some um, students who have said, I need to really focus on my accelerated math or I'm missing um, instruction that's happening in my classroom that I don't want to miss um, I'm feeling like they maybe need to catch up. So we're hoping that um, through recommendation that if we can have the program happen at the home school that will alleviate some of that, um, that need to, to back out of programming. Um, I have just one, one question based on the, <clears throat> the uh, potential to pull back on the sixth grade planning this I just want to clarify that's not to say that there isn't going to be a focus on the sixth grade students that are still cycling through yes. just that they're you're making a plan on how to address those students as well as the fourth grade ones coming in that will go to sixth grade mm -hmm. at the so I just don't want those of couple course. years of students to no. not receive the same kind of thought process that they've received absolutely so um, the guiding principle is going to be that we would um, slowly roll out any new implementation process. Mm -hmm. So we would look at um, fourth grade being a group that potentially would receive right. that um, programming five days a week, but we would keep our current model for fifth and sixth grade, which has been discussed with the board previously. Yeah. The, um, the point that um, Eleni was um, talking about was we had a conversation at one point about the potential of adding a subject matter at the seventh grade level for our current sixth graders. And really right now, because of the way that the classes are mixed and we're looking at ways to ensure that we're providing those middle school students with the most support that they can have, um, we want to ensure that we're doing that with its due diligence and not just adding a, a um, content area to their gifted programming. We really want that to be very thoughtful as well. And this particular group of fourth graders would be that first group to move up 
up to the middle school right. and so they would have that additional programming at that time thanks yeah thanks. absolutely yeah. and then on the math acceleration I know with double acceleration can be a challenge at times so I'll be curious to hear what the recommendations are because mm -hmm. moving your student who maybe is in you know fifth grade into a seventh grade classroom yeah. for some parents is a really hard decision absolutely. to make um, and you know how, what are the other supplemental ways you can provide to a gifted student who might be you know even beyond a double accelerator we've heard some of those comments before so yeah. I'm looking forward to the spring Great. report out that's gonna be good thank you thank you thanks for all your hard work you guys do a lot the committee has just done incredible yeah. work. thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All right, that brings us to reports to the board. First up is our superintendent report. Okay. Thank you very much. First and foremost, to everyone listening online or watching online and here in the audience, a happy new year. We're glad to see you. In terms of the superintendent's report, we just started back today, so it won't be as lengthy as it typically is. Uh, for personnel, <laughs> there are no updates uh, for personnel, but for curriculum and instruction, just a brief reminder that we are now in the winter benchmarking season. So all um, students will take uh, NAP testing in K through eight, and then many of our primary students will also be taking the Ames Web uh, Plus assessment. Um, we are also currently in the process of an ELA pilot, and so what that means is later this spring, we'll be asking the board, we'll be taking a recommendation from the committee uh, for curricular materials to make sure that we have the 30-day window that we've always had uh, for people to view those. They are going to be put on public display, all the pilot materials at the uh, Downers Grove Public Library as well as the district office on Warrenville Road. So those will all be uh, available to anyone who wants to uh, review those prior to any recommendation. We're anticipating that recommendation will likely come in March or April. And uh, we just want to make sure that we get all those materials on public display so people can see them and have the opportunity to ask Liz or her team any questions that they may have. Uh, after this, you're going to hear an update on the audit from fiscal year 23, so that will be the finance presentation for my update, so we'll skip over that real quick. Um, one of the things that our technology department is working on, uh, because we have a unique situation in our district while all of our schools are located in Downers Grove, but uh, we also have many unincorporated areas. And some of our students in those unincorporated areas don't have access to library cards. And then we also have other municipalities that feed into Downers Grove, whether that is um, Oak Brook or Woodridge or even little chunks of Lyle or Lombard or uh, other uh, towns. So there are many offerings that the Downers Grove Public Library does specifically for District 58 students that not all of our students can take advantage of because they may not be able to get a library card at the Downers Grove Library. So uh, James Eichmiller is working on an intergovernmental agreement with the Downers Grove Library uh, that would allow all of our students in District 58 to get a library card from the Downers Grove Public Library. Please note, uh, if you're like me and your kids check out books, sometimes they don't find their way back to the library. Uh, so <laughs> this would be up to individual families. So no student would be issued a library card unless their family wanted them to have a library card. So if the board were to approve that, that would be one of the uh, stipulations that we would have. So this would not be a, every kid gets it, parents on registration would indicate whether or not they wanted to do that and then we would issue them a uh, library card so we're excited about that and uh, again just really taking um, an equity approach as we go through these things to make sure that every student in 58 has the exact same opportunities in terms of special services, just a reminder, as our families return, uh, we are very proud of the new IEP meeting uh, facilitation system that we have. And so we are gonna be going through all of that with our uh, upcoming IEP meetings. We're very grateful to the families that allowed us to pilot this. Uh, we've gotten a lot of really good feedback uh, from Jessica, or about Jessica and her team. So again, just something uh, that we're very excited about with facilitated IEP and uh, really trying to continue to build uh, stronger bonds with all of our families during the IEP process. Facilities, I wanna thank Kevin Bardo and his team and many of our uh, partners in the audience. Uh, we started the construction projects uh, for our referendum, so it was a lot of, uh, a lot of celebrating as we started getting the ball rolling. Um, winter break construction work at both middle schools included areas of asbestos abatement to prepare for the spring and summer larger construction uh, projects. All areas received air clearances by a third party environmental testing company and we went ahead and notified staff and families at both of our middle schools uh, last week prior to returning. 
Additionally, contractors were at O'Neill to move some exterior doors. Um, we put a new exterior door in the gymnasium as we start our construction because that small gym behind the large gym will be knocked down uh, starting uh, you know, in the summer, so we had to put a new exterior door for safety procedures. Uh, if you've been around O'Neill a long time like I have, it's still a little weird seeing that exterior <laughs> door in the gym, but uh, that will be uh, part of the construction, so we're, we're happy for that. At the February board meeting, we are going to make a recommendation on a furniture uh, partner as we start to put <coughs> furniture for our new spaces. Uh, we uh, interviewed several firms. I want to thank uh, Todd, Kevin, our architects, and our owners rep especially for leading the way on uh, you know the uh, interviews. Uh, we are going to be recommending a company called Henriksen. Henriksen comes highly recommended uh, by all of our partners. Our owner's representative has done a lot of work with them. Our construction manager has done work with them, especially on higher ed projects. And uh, White and Company has also done uh, a few projects with them. So we're excited to make that recommendation. And um, in the next board packet, the board will be getting all that information. The public will have time uh, to review it. Uh, I was hoping that we wouldn't have to mention this under public relations. Uh, I was crossing my fingers thinking we would get away without any snow this winter, but it um, looks like January 2024 has uh, some different plans. As always, we were on the call with the county today, and uh, we can expect anything from rain to 10 inches of snow, so <laughs> we're not going to be making the call at this particular uh, time. But all kidding aside, though, um, we are obviously closely monitoring the weather. As an elementary district, our goal is always to have kids in school. That is where they learn best. Um, and due to the construction schedule, we can't have traditional snow days this year, so they would be uh, remote days if we had to do that. Um, that being said, we would never um, jeopardize student safety and our staff safety, but it does look like with the forecast, uh, the snow is gonna come over a 48 hour period. Um, they're talking about now they've reduced it to about four or five inches over that time. Uh, and so it does look like we are gonna be able to have in-person learning. As always, uh, we'll get on our conference call, superintendents about 4.30 a.m. We'll discuss it and uh, we will make the call at that time. As a reminder, we do not make the call that school is open. If you don't receive a call, school is always open. <laughs> if we start doing that, people will get confused and it will just lead to uh, mass chaos out there. So right now, again, school will be open tomorrow unless there's significant disruption uh, over the uh, you know evening hours. So um, again, we're gonna continue to encourage families to look over the e-learning plan that's posted on our website. So if we do have to have a remote learning plan sometime this winter, uh, families have access to that. I encourage everyone to take a look at that. Um, also, um, we went ahead and uh, prepared today with our students and staff in the event we need it tomorrow or Wednesday or Friday. Uh, Friday's looking uh, bad as well. So um, we just wanna make sure that uh, we continue to prepare for that and hopefully we never have to use it. Um, so that is it for the superintendent's report. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments? No. I'm really happy about the library card program. Thanks, James, for heading that up. All right, and then that brings us to the monthly business report. Todd Dreyfus. Uh, as we uh, noted last month, you will see that there's not a treasurer's report a year to date. <coughs> This is the earliest possible time to have uh, a board meeting on the, on the second Monday. Uh, and with the schedule last week uh, and when statements were coming in, we certainly, we just couldn't get those together. We will send those out though uh, in the next day or so as we uh, complete those and have those wrapped up uh, to the board and then post them out as well. We will also have them uh, at the uh, FAC meeting on Friday morning for them to, to see as well. So there's that piece. Uh, couple of things that you have on uh, the agenda for approval this evening is the registration fees. Uh, those, as the board recalls, um, were presented and discussed uh, last month at the December board meeting. Um, these follow an inflationary increases uh, for supplies and materials, with the exception of um, those items that are contractual based, namely the transportation. Uh, we have put the 9% um, increase on, on those fees. Uh, based on what we are to anticipate in our renewals uh, that we're hearing from our transportation companies. Those contracts will be coming to the board uh, in the near future in the spring. Um, the capital item, you'll have a presentation, uh, a review of that uh, with our capital team uh, at the time of um, when the board considers it. Uh, and then the last thing I have uh, is the audit presentation. And we have uh, Betsy Allen, uh, partner from Miller Cooper, uh, the district's independent auditor. 
uh, here to give a, a high-level recap. You have obviously the um, the audit before you. It's also in the in the agenda, uh, as well as the management letter and responses. Uh, again, this is uh, one of those things that will also be uh, Betsy will be coming to the FAC meeting on Friday morning um, to review that with them as well. Uh, perhaps you know, going into a little more in-depth conversation uh, with some of those items at that point. Um, but that is, um, and this is the time for that presentation. Uh, there's a um, an action item for the board to accept the audit. Um, simply a because you, know, you can't approve that uh, to the <coughs> exception acceptance and um, I should note that all of the items have been filed with the state at this point so I will turn over to um, Ms. Allen good evening good evening um, so I thought this year I know I've done this presentation for many years I have put a short presentation together um, that we can go through just to go over sort of to tell you what's in what reports we've issued um, and what's you know what specifically is within those reports um, that, that you guys have um, to to review so first of all just to start out just why does a district have an audit um, there is a legal requirement oh I'm sorry I have the <laughs> <pardon me. laughs> Um, there is a legal requirement for each district in the state of Illinois um, to have an audit by a qualified auditing firm who's also qualified to do audits in accordance with government auditing standards. ISBE requires that audits are done in accordance with government auditing standards. Um, the purpose of our audit um, you know, is to do an examination. And here it's very important we point out that we're here to obtain reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance, that your financial statements are free from material misstatement. We do use sampling, you know, to, to do all of our audit procedures, and therefore we're not looking at every transaction that is going um, through the district for the fiscal year. The primary purpose um, of, our, of our examination is for us to be able to provide opin the opinion on the 2023 financial statements, as well as provide some in relation to opinions on other documents and filings that are done. <coughs> we also... Um, <coughs> If needed, do um, provide an internal control communication, which we refer to as our management letter. Um, here we can provide recommendations if there's any deficiencies in control and then just other items for improvement and other efficiencies within the district. And lastly here, the professional standards do require us to um, discuss certain certain information um, with the board and we will look at some of those required communications later in the presentation <coughs> um, and this excuse me <coughs> this slide here um, does report all the final documents that were provided um, to the district we provided the annual financial report which are the gap financial statements which are what we're going to look at shortly um, we also have the annual financial report that's submitted to the Illinois State Board of <coughs> Education. This is their state form that is required to be filed with them with certain attachments. We also issue um, our report on government auditing standards as well as our single audit package and single audit opinion. Um, the district would expend over $750,000 and therefore is required to have a single audit. And then lastly, as we just talked about, is our required communication uh, to the board letter. This next slide um, displays the financial profile summary. The school code re requires Illinois State Board of Education to develop a calculation to help monitor all the finances of the school districts in Illinois. Um, you know, please remember that there can be extenuating circumstances outside the district's control um, with this calculation. It's a sub calculation that's done within the state AFR that's provided to ISBE. Um, this year, as you will see, the district would, did move down to the review, and this is mainly due, as you'll see in the last category, of the long-term debt margin remaining, and it's due to all the, the bonds that were issued from the referendum passage. So, like I said, it's where it's a it's a set um, calculation that's done, and it mainly, like I said, due to all the bonds being issued for from the passage of your referendum is what moved the district um, to that category this year. 
Um, this year we did have one new accounting standard um, that had to be implemented. It was GASB Statement num Number 96, the Subscription-Based Information Technology Arrangements. Um, and I'm sure it was the first year that, that James had to deal with the auditors very much. <laughs> so, <laughs> but thank you for his, for his assistance. Um, <laughs> we did analyze um, all the inf all the arrangements and the information that would fall under, um, could possibly fall under this statement. Um, after the analysis, we did determine that many of most of these were all short term and therefore did not affect the financial statement reporting. So the, on the next part, the next part is um, the GAP financial statements, which are the bound financial statements that you all had, should have received a copy of. And just want to go through the sections that are in that report. Um, the first part of the report, starting on page one, is the independent auditor's report. And again, this year we issued an, a clean, um, an unmodified clean opinion, which is the highest level of assurance that we can provide um, as auditors. Um, next within the document is a management discussion and analysis. Um, I always tell boards if you don't want to read all 100 pages, this management discussion and analysis is a great place um, to get an overview. It contains some financial highlights. It also has an overview and description of the statements that are contained within the document. Um, it provides some condensed financial statements um, as well as a, a listing of items that could have a financial impact to the district um, in the future. The next section is the basic financial statement starting on page 15. Here you're going to see the government-wide and the fund financial statements with reconciliations that describe the different basis, the different basis of accounting. There's also a lot of footnotes detailing the accounting policies and other information to help assist you in uh, un understanding better the information provided in the basic financial statements. The footnotes have a lot of information on the pension liabilities and OPEB, which are other post-employment liabilities, as, as well as the cash and investments, capital assets, and the debt of the district. The next two sections are the required supplementary information and supplementary financial information. Here there's schedules with multi-year information on those pension and OPEB liabilities, along with budgetary schedules for all of the funds of the district. And the last section of the, of the report contains the other supplemental information. Here there's schedules of all the general obligation bonds outstanding with the maturity schedules for each of those issuances. As we talked about before, there is a required communication letter to the board. Um, and here I just want to point out a few things that our audit was performed in accordance with government auditing standards and uniform guidance. Uniform guidance is what is followed to prepare the single audit. Um, the letter also contains a summary of future and um, current pronouncements that, that were effective from GASB. GASB is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Um, we already did discuss the GASB 96. Um, there is also a listing of Gatsby statements that will be effective in the future years. I believe for fiscal year 24, we finally have a, a year off of having to implement any uh, major, major Gatsby statements. Um, the letter also communicates to the board any significant accounting estimates and any financial statement disclosures. Um, that we had no significant difficulties dealing with management completing the audit. I want to thank Todd um, and his team for their assistance during the audit. Um, I know there's been <coughs> lots going on in the business office this past fiscal year, um, so but we all worked together and you know got the task accomplished and got everything filed. Uh, we also did not identify any unusual transactions. Uh, we did have one one adjustment that we did not post due to it not being material in regards to a penalty um, that is out there. And then management assigned and provided us um, with a representation letter in order for us to issue um, all the required documents. And the AFR and all the required documents were filed with the Illinois State Board of Education the day um, the documents were released. And then lastly, um, as Todd had already mentioned, we did issue um, our management letter. Um, I'm not going to go through each of the individual you know, items that are in the management letter. Um, I will be at the um, meeting on Friday morning to, to have any further discussion on that. I know Todd also provided um, his management responses and how the business office was going to proceed um, with these issues. Um, 
but I did just list out um, there are three levels you know of deficiencies there's a material weakness significant deficiency control deficiency and then I guess you call it a fourth we do have our management advice um, so here on, on this slide um, and the next slide I did just list out the different items that um, the different items that um, that we did report within this letter. I do see I have one mistake up there that I fixed in mine, but must have forgotten yours. <laughs> the electronic systems approval, that was actually just a management advice and not a control deficiency, so I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the last slide, this is my contact information. Um, if you ever have any questions or comments, you can certainly go through Dr. Russell or Todd, but my information is also available on this slide also. So does anyone have any questions or, or comments? Questions or comments from the board? I have a question. Uh, correct. I imagine you do this for other school districts as well. Uh, what, what are the material things that you might find that, you, that we should be aware of that come up in school districts? And clearly there wasn't anything that was material in ours, but uh, there was uh, just a sense from I only sit in 58, so I don't have a good sense of what other financial reporting looks like across the state. Are, are, you, are you asking about what other kind of findings we might yeah. find at other districts? Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we go from districts that have no findings to <coughs> districts that have minimal. Um, I mean, if you're looking for more material ones that we might see at some districts, um, I mean, we have districts that don't get their bank breaks done for, for the year. I mean, that's the major one I can think mm of. Um, ones that might have a lot of material audit adjustments. Um, we do assist all the districts with com with the conversion from the cash basis. You guys, um, the district keeps their internal records on a cash basis, and then as a non-audit services, we do assist in um, doing the adjustments with their assistance to the modified full accrual. Um, but there are times when we have some major cash cash adjustments for either items that aren't posted um, because they haven't done their bank recs, so therefore they don't know that they haven't posted items. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the top one I can think of off off of my head. You know, one thing I always tell districts, and it's never been an issue with District 58, is I guess if you do nothing else, you know, all month, you know, pay your employees and do your bank reconciliations. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. One of the other things too is that FAC Friday morning, we will mm -hmm. be discussing that at length. So if the board needs additional time to review, if you have any questions that pop up after this, you know, please feel free to send them to Todd or myself and we will certainly get answers to those at the FAC on Friday morning. Sorry. Could you go back just once? I think it's one slide. Oh, hang on, wrong button. I got it, thank you. Um, can you <laughs> just tell me under, uh, what accounts payable revenue cutoff means? Um, so <clears throat> part of you know part of the procedures we're doing to um, to com to convert to the modify accrual basis is <clears throat> you know posting the accounts payable but the listing is coming from from the district um, and so we get the listing from the district and then we also do testing on it you know based on different materialities and scopes sure. and we found um, some places where there was stuff that was Included that shouldn't have been, or it's not just included. Due to, yeah, just yeah, the, the cutoff, year. and I and it I believe move back and forth between yeah. before June 30th and after June right. 1st. Right, right. Okay. And so it's just it's just something, you know, they've had some new people starting. Sure. Um, just depending, just depending on, on the date on the invoice, this should have been in fiscal year 24. Right. This should be in fiscal right. 24. So, so like I said, you know, we will we'll, you know we'll continue to work with the district and you know assist them, you know, you know where we can and what we've done just sure. to make sure that mm -hmm. you know the information that, that we're getting the first time is more updated i believe the revenue cutoff had to do with um some push coin and what's the other one you use sorry i can look in my letter in the in the letter too that you were left there's like all the deep the de there's detail of each of these findings too like exactly what it was but the revenue cutout had to do with push coin and e-pay um, during like the last week of June there was some amounts that were proper that weren't that were excluded from the revenues mm -hmm. so because of you know, the timing that they're paying so it's really looking at the timing and ensuring that there's the there's a cutoff the cutoff is proper for our for our needs 
I think to get a true accurate depiction of what one fiscal year looks like compared to the other one, June 30th is, is really important having those proper cutoffs. So that's one of the mm -hmm. internal conversations that we were having. I think what made it uh, more challenging for us this year is our long time um, accounts payable person, or excuse me, our, our payable clerk, or uh, our okay. accounts payable, <laughs> let me start where I was. Um, we had a turnover. Um, Dr. Paddle left to become um, a chief school business official in a different district. And when when people typically leave in June, they're taking those last couple of weeks mm -hmm. to you know, get their vacation in and things like that. So a lot of the cleanup that would have normally taken place in that last week in June didn't happen. Now, that isn't an excuse. So one of the things that we have to do is to make sure that those proper cutoffs are in place and to make sure that um, you know, if we have that situation, which is inevitable in, in today's market, that um, just a lot or a little more cleaner on those, that June 30th deadline on both revenue and expenditures. But I do want to reiterate, you're, you're totally correct. I mean, your business office had some bad timing, you know, of, <laughs> of, of people going to other jobs and, um, you know, it seems to be happening more and more lately and with districts. And, um, you know, there's a lot of training that has to go in, you know, with newer people. and. Um, but I don't see any reason you guys won't get exactly where you need to be. <coughs> it's challenging because, you know, normally if you have that long-standing person in there and you get to that last week in June, they can say, oh, this is wrong, I need to correct it. Well, with that person not being in there and the new person starting on July 1, that's how something can get on the wrong year. And so Todd and I have uh, discussed that, and that is certainly in Todd's uh, letter to the FAC and to the board about um, some of those changes that we'll uh, put in place. I have one more question yes, for Todd, actually. Um, so, you know, the the um, this this is all this is a snapshot in time looking at, at our our financial status as of June thirtieth. Um, I'm still I want to be able to, to get an understanding of how this our new understanding of at the end of the fiscal year kind of impacts this current fiscal year. Um, I know you mentioned in a report to the board that there was some revenue that was received more than 60 days past the end of the year that did not get recorded in fiscal year 23 and is not being recorded in fiscal 24. So I guess what I'm, I'm looking for, uh, perhaps there could be an update to the board in, in the coming weeks, maybe something we could have a conversation at a future board meeting or workshop, is um, how does this affect the big picture? Mm -hmm. So I expressed concern uh, at the um, at the, at the time we were adopting the budget that we weren't quite hitting the, the, the 35% uh, policy um, requirement for fund balances and anticipated fund balances on June 30th of 2024. Uh, obviously this changes the math a little bit. Um, but you know, at the same time though, because we're missing all that revenue from 23, now our fund balances have taken a significant dip. Um, so in, in just in the, in the context of this snapshot of time, but also looking at yeah. you know, our, our five-year plan, how are we doing? I guess we just need a little bit of an update to understand how all this affects each other. Yes and yes. And so that is one of the things. And obviously, as we're going through, you know, as we are now starting, you know, the planning process for 2425 and the five-year planning, uh, we actually, I think, started that uh, really, you know, early December uh, as a... Uh, um, you know, management team. Um, that is the conversation we've been we've been talking about, uh, and so I think we can we can step you through the impact of where the June thirtieth ends in that position, uh, what it looks like in twenty four, and then what it's going forward. And um, you know, twenty three. Yes, we did um, rely more on the fund balance because we did not take in um, and and go out and, and bring in some of that ESSER 3 money that we had intended on um, and understand that ESSER 3 money is a, is a an open piece that we were going to we spread between 23 and 24 we didn't bring that in it will all be coming in in 24 um, and so that is the, you know, that has that impact and in, in to help that piece uh, so there's that aspect of it there is the aspect also that there is revenue uh, again you know, because of our staffing structure some of those federal grants um, that didn't that we would have normally had booked in June or July and had that money come in in, in July August that would have shown up in the audit might not have shown up in cash on June 30th but it was shown up in the audit 
um, as an increase in or as a federal revenue that would attribute back that came in in end of September you know September October mm -hmm. so that is now 24 money it won't be you know it's not 23 so that aspect as well as an increase you know to in, in, in to, a, to the positive side on fiscal year 24 um, so we'll go through yes we can put together uh, a format to kind of detail out you know point by point overall how we're stepping through to ensure that we're still meeting the fight you know within the financial requirements and, and constraints that we need to be uh, both with the 35 percent fund balance and the capital structure and and uh, and also then you know covering program costs and so forth and going forward um, as we're working through and moving on to the next planning piece as well so that that is certainly on our mind and we've actually been Dr. Russell and I've been having several conversations about it uh, like weekly uh, just kind of going through and making sure that we are where we're at is we're closing out and then what it's going to look like moving forward so that it you know that what so what's your vision for like communicating this to the board in terms of uh, I mean I know we have it usually I think we could bring workshop or would be some yeah I think we could bring back pieces of that before that um, you know and we can certainly look at how that looks like when we're, we're coming back in you know February and, and certainly March Okay, great. Uh, board and, meetings to have we're looking at the review. overall calendar when the five-year plan comes okay. before the board right. I think that would be a nice thing to dovetail in um, in addition to the five-year plan which obviously they're not mutually exclusive but to really have a separate conversation about your question in particular just to reassure the board that that revenue will be captured in this fiscal year and that the fund balance 35% uh, will be obtained great thank you any other questions from a board member at this time did I answer what you were yes asking? yes okay. thank you mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for being here. We'll see you on thank Friday. You. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the committees. First up is the policy committee. They met on December the 10th. Uh, Vice President Harris. Oh, yeah. Um, December 19th, we met at O'Neill. Um, we had a, um, what do we usually get, like a, uh, an update a couple times a year? Yep. So this was a, a sizable one. Um, and the committee went through all of them, and, and the, this you know, probably t few dozen uh, policies affecting everything from personnel to the, the operations of the Board of Education to some curriculum pieces. Uh, some of them <coughs> were some language changes, changes. Some of them were just simple um, legal reference updates. Um, the the um, our our procedure as a Board of Education, we we don't just right right away approve them. They're they're here for a first reading tonight. We will give the, the community and the board a month to digest them, and we will um, come back in February and vote on them um, well, after everybody has a chance to understand uh, the changes. Um, like I said, there are many of them to go over, so I won't, I won't take up the time to go over every single one, because um, that took us an hour at the meeting. However, if anybody has any specific questions, of course, Tracy or I or Dr. Russ will be able to answer them. Mm -hmm. Hearing none, seeing none. Yet? It sounds like these are pretty just standard updates. Yeah, I don't think that there's anything in here that is, you know, particularly controversial. I think what you see is, uh, you know, as laws get passed in Springfield, uh, these are quick updates. Or in this one in particular, you saw, you know, some of the laws taking first or taking place, excuse me, on January 1st. So, you know, for instance, uh, the anti-opioid uh, medication um, that is now law that every school has to have that. And so you would see that policy being updated in order to align with the law. That's just one example uh, of, of what you would see. Um, yeah. And our, and our policy committee is a diverse group of stakeholders in the community. Um, and the fact that none of them really generated a significant amount of discussion um, leads, me, leads me to believe that this is um, there's nothing um, earth-shattering earth, earth in this thing. All right, then. Is there a motion to approve for first reading the policies and press issue 113 as presented by the policy committee? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchin. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. All right, the motion carried to approve for first reading the policies and press issuance 113 as presented by the policy committee. Anything else? Nope. All right. That moves us on to the legislative committee. They met on December the 20th, 2023. Uh, Member Harris? No. I'm uh, sorry, Hannes. 
Uh, yes, we met on the 20th for Legislative Committee. Um, the main focus of the meeting was to continue to plan and prepare for legislative breakfast, which is going to be on February 2nd, hopefully, if there's no snow. It seems like there's always snow that day, but <laughs> um, So we are going to start around 7 a.m. with kind of the mingling portion and then move into similar format that we've had in years past with a um, kind of a, a full group session of questions for all legislators and then breaking out into the small groups for kind of a more discussion formatted approach. Um, so we brainstormed a little bit just kind of um, broad topics and then we're going to work on formulating actual questions and things like that this week when we meet on Wednesday um, you know to get down a little bit you know into more of the specifics of what we want to be asking um, and things like that but that's pretty much it. it was it was pretty short and sweet we did talk a little bit about some um, current legislation and things that's being discussed in Springfield but nothing kind of similar like you guys were saying nothing foreshadowing nothing super controversial or anything that that came up and we don't anticipate any anything super controversial at the breakfast as well most of the topics were pretty um you know we, we don't expect a lot of commotion so thanks i think the one what's the fun term, in that i don't know <laughs> the one long-term thing um that we briefly touched on um is the tier two pension fix that mm -hmm. is coming um the pension fix that they put in place for trs not for imr remember the majority of our employees are under the trs <coughs> retirement uh, system where um, some of our custodial staff and office staff would be under IMRF. Um, IMRF is a very well-funded pension system um, that is, is a very um, st uh, stable long-term. TRS is not, and uh, there are different tiers. One of the fixes they tried to do a few years ago, around 2012, um, was to change the benefit structure for those that entered into the system after 2012. One of the problems they have with that is that that benefit structure doesn't meet the requirements of if you were in the social security system because teachers are not in the social security system their benefits would have to match those and because they don't it's only a matter of time before a lawsuit is brought up um, from someone in tier two so the state is going to have to do something about tier two i wouldn't expect that it's going to be imminent um, but down the road that is going to become a, a conversation because um, the way they can fix it is really one of two ways the state can fix it or they can just push it right back on uh, the local school districts mm -hmm. that happens in a system that's already you know heavily reliant on local property taxes especially in DuPage County that can become very problematic so that is something obviously we're watching uh, very closely and uh, both legislators um, and uh, educators throughout the state are working on fixes and recommendations uh, to that so a lot more to come in the coming years on that particular issue uh, and we briefly touched on that in the legislative committee Any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Is that everything, Emily? That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Financial Advisory Committee has not met yet. We meet this Friday. So that brings us to the district leadership team who met on the 18th. Member Doshi? Yeah, we had a good meeting. With, this was the first where we had a primary focus on her new strategic plan uh, and walking through each of the items on the strategic plan with an update on where we are. Obviously, we're in the early stages. This is our first year of this new plan. And so we uh, focused primarily on the logistics of how we'll provide update or how we'll hear updates, what we'll provide statuses for in color coding systems uh, so that the community and us as a board and the district as a whole uh, can have a good sense of where we are in each of our goals. Uh, and so uh, we'll be able to see that in our, uh, in our uh, periodic updates uh, in our packets on Fridays. Uh, and I imagine in other ways that, uh, Kevin, you can share around how we, we as a board might engage in the strategic plan updates. Yeah, and one of the things, uh, you know, as Krat was sharing, uh, Faith and, and James are working right now on uh, revamping our website around the strategic plan so those that aren't as involved in the work have a place to go and in, in, in to check. And uh, we really appreciated the feedback that we got. Again, we have um, not just board members, we have staff members and also community members on there who really gave us feedback in terms of what the community would like to see and what our staff would like to see on the progress there. So you can expect a lot of updates to our website. Um, we will be archiving the previous strategic plan that way people can still 
access if they or access it if they want it. But obviously, we want to make sure that um, we put the current strategic plan um, front and center. And then finally, don't forget that at the May meeting, we will be doing kind of a year in review, letting the board know um, how far we've come in a year. So you're replacing, you're going to archive the old dashboard, and then you're going to create some new t style of dashboard? That's correct. Yeah. And so the, the new dashboard, what you will see is more in line with what it looked like toward the end of the last strategic plan. Because what we saw in, in the anecdotal feedback that we received from numerous committees and stakeholders is we, we kind of did a running record. So that works out great in year one, but by the time you're to year five, you're going through 15 pages to figure out where they're at right now. And, and so more um, succinct updates, more archiving, uh, so people can go ahead and, and take a look at that. So really just listening more to the community and wanting to make sure that if anyone goes in there, they have a they can just very quickly see where we're at or quite frankly, where we're not at. Anything else, Member Doshi? No. Nope. Any questions or comments? All right. The Health and Wellness Committee has not met. Uh, SAS report, Dr. Russell. Yeah, so um, SASET has a new executive director, so we're very excited about uh, that. Both the uh, board of directors and the governing board uh, worked side by side on that. So what you'll anticipate uh, or what we'll see coming or what you can anticipate in the spring is um, our two interim superintendents right now transitioning and onboarding our new superintendent um, or executive director in place. And one of the conversations we are having given the turmoil that um, you know, ha has happened at SASA whenever you have one director leave and you're going through interims, is to talk about perhaps um, extending the interims for a month or two, so as that new person comes in, they can work side by side uh, with that. But I really want to compliment Mark Cross, who's taken over uh, the board of directors. Um, there's just a different level of professionalism uh, at the special education cooperative, and um, you can tell that when you come into the meetings, and it's very efficiently run, and uh, you know things are just moving in the right direction at uh, SASA. The new executive director <coughs> is from District 230, which is um, Sandburg uh, High School, uh, Andrew High School, Stag High School, and Orland and, and Payless, that area. Prior to that, um, she worked in District 99, and prior to that, she worked in a special education cooperative. That was very important to us, that we had someone who had high school experience, had elementary experience, but also worked in a cooperative. Cooperatives are unique. They don't function the same way as school districts because they're made up of many school districts. SACS is one of the biggest cooperatives, and so we wanted to make sure that that person um, you know, had the ability to not only emphasize relationships, but also knew how cooperatives should function and uh, knew the local area too. So uh, very happy about that. Thank you. Questions or comments from the board? All right, thanks. All right, we have no discussion items tonight, so that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity as members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to in get, enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to a future agenda or addressed by administrative staff when appropriate. The board is allotted 30 minutes tonight. We ask that you keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. At this time, I've received one card uh, from Jennifer Hsu out of Kingsley. Hello again. You probably all remember me, but to remind anyone who wasn't here last month, my name is Jennifer Hsu, and I'm the parent of the second grader who isn't allowed to go to school, courtesy of Miss Jessica Stewart over there. I wanted to update you all that we are now a month further into the school year and my son is still sitting at home waiting for his free and appropriate public education. As an aside, Dr. Russell, it doesn't matter if there's rain or 10 inches of snow tomorrow, my son will still be at home instead of in the classroom where he would learn best. Uh, as the district continues spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on its fight to keep one child out of school, I can't help but wonder why. See, this problem could go away if you'd hire just one instructional assistant at $20,000 a year, or if you'd send him to a SASID program, or if you'd send him to a Lyle or Woodridge school at the non-resident rate of $20,000, $30,000 a year. All requests that we did make to you, and by the way, we were told no, no, no. It makes me wonder if there is something more sinister going on here, something that one or more of you is trying to cover up. Could it be that you can't find anyone to fill these aid positions because the salary is so pitiful? So rather than getting a teacher or social worker or the principal or even you, Dr. Russell, to fill in as an aid, 
someone else decided just to fob my child off on a therapeutic school. An expense that's probably in somewhere in the $80,000 range that you'll just get the state to cover. In other words, you can't hire aides, so instead of solving that problem, you're shipping kids out to outplacements that ultimately you won't have to pay for. Is that the reason? Are you defrauding the state and spending hundreds of thousands of ta dollars of taxpayer money to cover up what you're doing? I wonder what the state's attorney would think of that. Start asking some questions, please, because what you're doing defies logic. I'd rhetorically ask you to consider how much you're willing to spend on this problem because I'm in this for the long haul. By the way, uh, yeah, I, I, I was going to say that earlier, Dr. Russell, my son will not be in school regardless of the weather this week. So, again, if they ask, please start asking some questions because I'd really like to know how much you're willing to spend to keep one kid out of school. Have a good night. Thank you. It's the only card I have present tonight. Is there anyone else that wishes to come up and make a public comment? Okay, then that brings us to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions tonight to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the December 11th, 2023 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the December 11th, 2023 meeting as presented. Next up is our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right, uh, then is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. We have a couple items up for action tonight. The first one is the fiscal year 2023 uh, audit report. Is there a motion to accept the fiscal year 23 audit report as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to accept the fiscal year 23 audit report as presented. We have the 2024 through 2025 school fees. Is there a motion to approve the 2024 through 2025 school fees as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? I have a question. This obviously we are in a high inflation year, and yeah. this is a 6.5 percent increase in rates. Uh, I'm wondering what what are we what are, what is our practice proactively to reach out to families that this might be a significant increase for? in terms of the school fees yeah so there's a couple of things that we do with uh, families that may be struggling to pay um, first and foremost anyone who qualifies for free and reduced lunch under the federal poverty guidelines um, does have the ability uh, to get their fees waived there are parents who are more um, in the in-between uh, where they might not qualify mm -hmm. for um, free and reduced but the fees might be a, a little challenging for them. So we work with every single family um, if they're unable to pay the full amount at once. Uh, we have had several families on uh, payment plans throughout the school years. We reach out to them um, you know, individually. Uh, so what we do in, in that case, if somebody hasn't paid their fees, um, we reach out to them proactively and ask them how we can help and how we can assist. There's also a provision um, in our board policy where the superintendent can waive fees um, on an unprecedented uh, setting basis because what happens sometimes is when people fill out the federal form uh, they may be employed and then they may lose their job or they may have a medical hardship or you know so on paper they may look like they can qualify for that payment but in reality they can't and so there are hardship exemptions and all of those things so when we get uh, you know any kind of an inkling that someone's struggling to pay and they haven't reached out to the us, we reach out um, to them. And so long as someone is working with the district and doing everything they, they can, and sometimes that means they can't do anything, but they're still keeping communication with us, we don't send families to collections or, or things like that. Um, very rarely will we get someone who says, I um, believe public schools should be free and I'm not paying any fees. Um, the Supreme Court of Illinois has ruled that as long as fees are reasonable, you do have to pay them for a public school and so obviously we'll treat that individual different than somebody who is uh, struggling. So um, we also recognize the fact that when people are struggling, 
they might not be as willing to reach out to us. And so we do rely on our buildings, our secretaries, our principals, our social workers. Um, they often will contact us and share information about that. So it's kind of a combination of the building and the district uh, reaching out. But certainly the first contact someone is going to get from us isn't a you know, threatening letter or anything like that to be their feet. Thank you. Anything else? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchin. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the 2024 through 2025 school fees as presented. Next up, we have some surplus equipment, in, uh, including a computer cart and floor machine. Uh, is there a motion to designate as surplus the items listed in the attached memo? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Any discussion on this? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to designate as surplus the items listed in the attached memo. We have a construction consent agenda tonight. Is there a motion to approve the cons uh, construction consent agenda consisting of bid group number two, phase one elementary schools? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The, cons the construction consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. A couple of announcements. Wednesday, January 10th at 3.45 p.m. will be a legislative committee meeting at O'Neill Middle School. Wednesday, January 31st at 3.45 uh, p.m. will also be a legislative committee meeting at O'Neill Middle School. And then Monday, February 12th at 7 p.m. will be the next regular board meeting. But also this Friday, yeah, this Friday, January 12th is the FAC uh, meeting. And that'll take place at O'Neill uh, Middle School as well. And that will be in the library at O'Neill uh, and not the PDC. Okay. So we'll note that for people as they um, walk in. Uh, what are we getting? So for this, uh, there is no personnel and no uh, collective. So C, D, E, and F. Okay. All right. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to close to, uh, to discuss? Uh, the consideration of school disciplinary matters, that's five, I'm sorry, student disciplinary matters, that's five LCS 122C9. Uh, the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters related to individual students, it's 5 LCS 122C10. Litigation, when a public body finds out that action is probable or imminent, in which case is the basis for the finding uh, and shall be recorded and entering into minutes of a closed meeting, that's 5 LCS 122C11. And the discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of the approval of the body of minutes or the semi-annual review of minutes is mandated by section 2.065 ILCS 122 C21. I have to know. I have to do A. Uh, the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district. Um, that's 5 LCS 122 C1. Is there a motion? So Second. Second. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Uh, let's meet at 840.